Okay. So let us do a quick recap once again of the entire mind map that we have. Post the recap, we shall proceed further. So let me share the screen and we shall proceed. Once again, you know, if you want to access the mind map, all you need to do is go to 360digitmg.com, the URL, and then access mind map by clicking on mind map here. Within the drop down, you'd find an option called certificate program in data science. Click on that and you would find the mind map. You just need to double click to expand a particular branch in the mind map and you double click to collapse. <clears throat> and here is a project management methodology which is called as CRISP MLQ. CRISP MLQ stands for Cross Industry Standard Process for Machine Learning with Quality Assurance. And this has six phases. Phase one is business understanding and data understanding. Then you have phase two, three, four, five, and six. We already discussed about business understanding and as part of which we need to record the business objectives and business constraints. And while you record the objectives and constraints, Please bear in mind that we always need to write the objectives and constraints using two to three words and four to five words max or a paragraph, or sorry, or a sentence. It should never be, that is your objectives and constraints should never be, you know, paragraphs long. They should be short, crisp, clear. And to the extent possible, Try to use the terms such as minimize or maximize. And you also need to record the success criteria. First comes the business success criteria because we are trying to solve a business problem. To solve a business problem, since we are using machine learning techniques, we also record machine learning success criteria. Alongside that, we also need to understand what are the cost benefits. So you have economic success criteria as well. Okay. Then we proceed further with data understanding. Or we discussed about data understanding rather. Even before we go and collect the data, which will help us solve the business problem, we try to understand data types. And as part of this, we spend some time understanding what is continuous data and what is discrete data. Within discrete data, we once again have categorical data and count data. We try to understand the difference between these two. And within categorical data, we have binary and multiple, and within multiple, we have nominal data and ordinal data. We also know for a fact that nominal data is the least preferred data type. And we have continuous data in which we have interval data and ratio data. And the most preferred data type happens to be ratio data. Then we have qualitative data and quantitative data. And we know for a fact that Okay, let me take this to the other side so that I scribble a bit. And we know for a fact that qualitative data means categorical data. Quantitative data means numbers. So continuous data and count data would be part of quantitative data type. Then we have structured, semi-structured and unstructured data types. We know for a fact that structured data is that data which can be represented in tabular format. Here are a few examples. Unstructured data is data which cannot be placed in a tabular format 
in its raw state. However, this can be transformed. The videos or images or audio or textual data, these things can be transformed. And these data types can be made structured. And we also discussed that tabular data is also called as columnar data. While transforming the unstructured data into structured format is a bit difficult. Transforming semi-structured data into structured format would be easier, relatively easier. HTML files, XML files, JSON files, all these are part of semi-structured data types. And then we have big data versus non-big data. Yesterday we discussed, oh sorry, in the previous module we discussed that we have three Vs, that is volume, velocity, and variety. But a few people say four Vs, a few people say five Vs, six Vs, seven Vs, so on and so forth. But at a high level, remember that if you have huge volume of data getting generated at a rapid pace, and if you have variety of data, if you have these three characteristics, then the data would be called or classified as big data. For these veracity means there will be a lot of uncertainty in the data. That is what veracity means. Okay, non-big data would. This is all that we discussed as part of our previous session. Now, let's proceed further and try to understand cross-sectional data, time series, longitudinal data, balance versus imbalanced data sets, and offline versus online processing of the data. So let's proceed further. Okay. First of all, let us understand the difference between cross-sectional versus time series. Then we will look at the differences among these three, which is panel longitudinal data. Let me explain cross-sectional data first. Let me bring in the data. Suppose you have the data on who are the patients who were tested positive with respect to COVID and who were the people who were tested as negative, so no COVID, patient one. Patient two also does not have COVID. Patient three is COVID positive. Four, five, six, so on and so forth. Say you have data of thousand patients. Usually this variable of interest would be called as output variable, but anyways, that's the data. For each and every customer, you have the information. And the output variable is represented using one. And you have age, uh, sorry, name, age, gender, number of hospital visits, historical health conditions, so on and so forth. So you have a lot of inputs. Given this data, does it work in this way? wherein? If you go and visit a hospital on Monday at 11 a.m., no matter what, the results will say that you will not have COVID because this is very auspicious time. Monday, 11 a.m., probably that happens to be very auspicious. And that is why probably you are tested negative for COVID. But then if you go to hospital on Tuesday at 9 p.m., this is some kind of unauspicious, uh, you know, time, probably Rahukal, right? And no matter what, if you get yourself tested for COVID, you would be tested as COVID positive, no matter what. Does it work this way? that based on the date and time that you visit a hospital to get yourself tested for COVID, 
the outputs are determined whether you are COVID positive or negative. Does it work this way? Not at all. It doesn't work this way, friends. Date and time when a specific patient visits hospital will not determine whether you will be tested negative or positive. Given this context, cross-sectional data is that data where date and time is unimportant. Since date and time is unimportant, the sequence in which you arrange the data becomes unimportant. So you need not sort the data in the ascending order. You need not say that, you know what, this patient visited on 1st Jan, this patient on 2nd Jan, 3rd Jan, 4th Jan, 5th Jan, 6th Jan. In this manner, you need not have the data in a sequence. You need not sort the data because the output on whether you are tested positive or negative does not really depend on what your uh, date and time happens to be. So this kind of data where date and time becomes unimportant and hence the sequence in which you arrange the data becomes unimportant is called as cross-sectional data. Then we have time series data set. When it comes to time series data set, the date and time and the sequence in which you arrange the data would become extremely important. and you'll have only a single variable in your data set. For example, say you're looking at number of COVID-19 cases. When you deal with the number of COVID-19 cases, you need to arrange the data in a sequence. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. So it has to be arranged in the sequence. And you can arrange the data in a sequence because you have the variable called date and time. So when date and time becomes important. And since you have date and time variable, you can sort the data in a sequence. And hence, sequence becomes important. This kind of data set, wherein date and time becomes important and hence the sequence in which you arrange the data becomes important, is called as time series data set. And one more important observation is that when you look at cross-sectional data, usually, typically, usually, you'll have more variables, more features. You'll have more than one feature. But when it comes to time series data set, you would have a single feature, number of cases, single variable. Of course, you'll have date and time. That also is a column, but then number of cases is an important feature. Alongside date and time variable, you would have only a single variable, right? When it comes to time series data sets. Then we have panel data versus a panel or longitudinal data sets. You pronounce it as longitudinal or longitudinal, doesn't matter. American and British pronunciations. Okay, so in this kind of a data set, this would take the properties of both cross-sectional data sets and time series data sets. Panel data or long longitudinal data would take the properties of both cross-sectional data sets as well as time series data sets. In cross-sectional data, you have multiple variables. So here also you'll have multiple variables. Of course, this should be Malaysian. Sorry for that. Okay. So you have 
India, Malaysia, and America. So you have multiple columns. You have the number of COVID-19 cases on Jan 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, so on and so forth across the various countries. So one thing is from cross-sectional data, since cross-sectional data has multiple variables or features. Here also you have multiple variables or features, point number one. Point number two, time series data has a variable called date and time, and the data is sorted in a sequence, and so is panel or longitudinal data. So you take the properties of time series data, and then you have this data set here. So panel or longitudinal data encompasses, includes the properties of both cross-sectional data as well as time series data. And that would be called as panel or longitudinal data. Next. We also need to understand on what is the difference between balanced data set versus imbalanced data set. And let's talk about that. So even before I go to the animation and show you that, let me explain first. Suppose you have a data set. And say you have within this data set multiple features. Features are nothing but columns. And one of the feature, which is your output variable, is going to uh, talk about whether a customer would churn or not churn. Churn means Say you're using a specific mobile service of probably AT&T or Airtel or, you know, Cellcom, etc. If you switch to a different service provider, meaning say you switch to Verizon or maybe you switch to um, Geo or maybe you switch to TN, right? Whichever service provider you switch, the moment you switch from one provider to another, it is called as churn. You are churning, customer churn. If you leave a specific brand and then if you switch to another brand, it need not just be in telecom. It could be something related to e-commerce. Maybe you stopped using Amazon and probably you diverted your attention to Flipkart. So that means customer has churned from using Amazon to uh, Flipkart. Same is the case with OTT, any OTT, right? If, if you're a customer who have been frequently using Netflix and if you switch to Hotstar, that's called as customer churn. And say you have various variables or inputs such as age, gender, income, educational qualification, uh, what kind of telecom plan this customer was using, so on and so forth. And say you have data of 10,000 customers. To determine whether this data set is balanced or imbalanced, you need to just look at the output variable. If within this output variable, if you have 50% of observations as churn and another 50% of observations as not churn, then this data set would be called as balanced data set. If, say, the churn is 40% and not churn is 60%, still, you say that this is a balanced data set. 30%, 70%, still it is called as balanced. Until here, it is called as balanced, my dear friends. But if one of the classes, either churn or not churn, if one of these classes is going to have 
less than 30%. For example, say 29% of the observations say customer would churn. Another 71% of the customers say customer would not churn. In this kind of a scenario, you say that the data set is imbalanced or unbalanced or rare events. In this kind of data would be called as balanced. Okay. Whenever you take example of any company, right? Will more number of customers churn? Would more number of customers switch from one provider to another? Not really. So those are rare events. If I take example of credit card transactions, fraud and not fraud. And if, I mean, in such a data set, for instance, would majority of the credit cards be fraud? Credit card transactions be fraud or not fraud? Majority of the transactions would not be fraud. Only a few transactions would be fraud. Right. So the number of fraud cases will be rare. Hence, it's called as rare event. If you take example of loan default, would majority of the customers who take the loan default? Not really. Only a small proportion of customers default on the loan. And hence, those events are called as rare events. Okay. Having discussed this part of it, if your output variable here is categorical, and if you have two classes, two categories, then you go with this rule, which says that if one of the classes, either churn or not churn, if one of the classes has less than 30% of the data, then it would be called as imbalanced data set if your output variable has two classes or two categories. Then this rule applies like a T. However, if you have a variable which is continuous in nature, then If you have a variable which says salaries of people, salaries of people who get trained on data science. Obviously, it depends on whether you're maintaining or running notes while listening to the session or not, because that would probably mean that you're attentive and your attendance uh, is very important. The second variable might be whether you're watching the recorded video two times or not. Third variable is whether you're reading the mind map or not, right? In that way, say there are a bunch of inputs which will determine your salaries. So your output variable happens to be salaries of people. And when we talk about salary, I'm sure you all would say that that is going to be a continuous variable. Why would that be continuous in nature? Because salaries can be in decimal format also. If you open your bank statement and if you look at the money that you have in your bank account, uh, it might say 10,000.03, so on and so forth. So it would be represented in decimal format. So if you take salary, and if you were to plot it, okay, I'm going to explain more in further detail about a specific plot called as normal distribution. For now, don't worry too much, but just remember this term. As I've told you, I have this habit of introducing the terms and terminologies, the lingo and the language, in this manner, wherein I'll just keep talking about a specific term until it gets into your brain. 
and then I'll explain about the concepts in detail. Okay. For now, if you have a variable which is continuous in format, right, which is a continuous data type, and then when you do something called as a histogram, forget about that for now. I mean, when you look at the data distribution, if it follows a normal distribution, that means to cut it at the center, the left side and the right side would be symmetrical. If you have this kind of a representation, then you say that your data are balanced. Okay, if your output variable is continuous, you check for the data distribution. If your data are normal, then you say that your data are balanced. Sometimes you might have data like this. Or you might have data like this. All these are examples of data being non-normal. If your data are non-normal, that means your data are imbalanced. Or we say that we have rare events. Okay. Next. Oh, one more very important thing is who determine these rules? I'm saying that if the output variable is categorical, if it has two classes or two categories, then if one of the classes has less than 30%, then you say that your data are imbalanced. Who is saying this? These are called as thumb rules. Okay, the rule that if one of the class has less than 30% of data, then it would be called as imbalanced, is called as a thumb rule. Thumb rules are determined based on the experience of people working on the projects for years together. And if majority of the data scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, economists say that if one of the class is less than 30%, we can say that it is imbalanced. There is no balance in the data. Then based on that experience, practical real world application experience, we take that as a thumb rule. Thumb rule means you need to take it with a pinch of salt. Because these thumb rules are coming from the experience of the people. So a few people might say less than 20% means imbalanced. A few people might say that, you know what, if one of the classes is less than 10%, then I'm going to call that as imbalanced. Sure, you can. Because it's not universally proven through any statistics. It's just a number which is coming out to us through experience of a lot of people working for centuries together. Hope that gives you some context. If it is, if one of the classes is less than 30%, only then you can consider that as imbalanced data set. Not for any other rules. Simple. Simple. Right? Okay. So, what if your output variable happens to be a categorical variable? And what if it has more than two classes? If you have two classes, it is called as binary. Okay, let me also write it down. If you have two classes, it's called as binary. And if you have more than two classes or if you have more than two categories, okay, then it is called as multiple categorical data. Here, there is no thumb rule as such, friends. Especially when your output variable is categorical and if it has two classes or two categories, that is when you have multiple categorical data, we do not have a thumb rule as such. It goes by common sense. For example, say you have a specific data set. Well, you have images. Okay. You have images of tiger, lion, 
cat and a dog. Just as an example, I'm taking this, okay? Just to push my idea through. If 25% of the data is tiger, 30% is lion, another 33% is cat, and say another 32%. Am I okay? So uh, not you know giving you the right percentage, maybe say another 20. I'm not usually like this, but <laughs> okay. Anyways, here we have 55, and then um, uh, let me say another 25. Okay, and then another 20 percent here. Okay, if you have a data set like this, okay, then would you call this as balanced or imbalanced? Twenty-five percent and twenty percent. I would rather say that hmm, seems like pretty okay. I mean, one of these classes is not significantly less, or one of these classes or one of these categories is not significantly large. Maybe I might feel that this is balanced data set. So it goes by your IQ level, absolutely, friends. Suppose you have ten percent tiger. 30% lion, another 30% cat, another 30% dog. Would this be called as balanced or imbalanced? One of the classes is significantly less in comparison to the other classes. So I would call this as imbalanced data set. Okay. But a few of you all might say, hey, probably I would also call this as balanced because Three of the classes have equal distribution. Only one has unequal distribution. So I would still call this as balanced data set. Maybe you might want to call it in that way, sure. But then when in doubt, apply techniques assuming that your underlying data set are balanced. Or, and also apply imbalanced you know, data techniques, assuming that your data set is imbalanced. Try out both the techniques. Whichever techniques give you good results, stick to that. When in doubt, experiment. When in doubt on which profession should I choose? Should I pursue engineering or should I pursue medicine? Or should I try out becoming a sports person? Then try out all three, right? First, do your engineering, pursue that. If you are able to do well, proceed further. Or if not, come do your medicine for another four, five years. Pursue and if a lot of patients are dying, then probably you are good at sports. So play sports. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jokes aside. But then whenever you are in doubt, especially when it comes to data science, you are expected to experiment, friends. Okay experiment apply techniques assuming data are balanced apply techniques assuming data are imbalanced and see which of these techniques is giving you good good results stick to that okay all right so now let us proceed further and talk about the next topic And the next topic happens to be batch data, offline versus live streaming data. Now, this becomes a very important topic for me to explain you all because there is going to be a lot of information out there in this. So, bright screen all of a sudden, yeah, your eyes will be like, oh my God. Okay. So, let us talk about an example pertaining to batch processing. This batch processing is also called as offline processing. Okay. 
okay batch processing or offline processing okay suppose you are trying to build a loan default prediction model so the first thing that you have to do is you need to go get access to the historical data and say the bank provides you with the data wherein you have the output variable which is whether a customer would default on the loan or not default on the loan and say you have 10000 observations and say you also have various inputs age gender income so on and so forth you take this data and you build a prediction model how do you build a prediction model by applying machine learning algorithms say you applied a machine learning algorithm and using that you build a prediction model now if there is a new customer which is 10000 first customer you take all the required inputs supply these inputs to your machine learning algorithm which would then classify whether a person will default or not default okay and say for this customer who is say customer a let me call this as customer a 10000 first customer your prediction says that for this customer a there is 90% chance or probability that the customer would default the moment you get this information you take this information and you write it back to your database wherein you'll have another column which says probability of someone defaulting on the loan and you enter the data here okay now say you have another customer who has applied for the loan you get the details take those details once again supply it to your machine learning algorithm and then you get the prediction out for custom b say there is 30% probability that this person will default now take this information and again write it back to your database customer b say you have another customer c say you have data take that supply to the machine learning algorithm and then for customer c you get the prediction sign say the prediction now says that there's 50% chance that a customer might default again you take that data that information write it back to the database and then you'll have bunch of predictions now what happens is all these results would get displayed onto the visualization dashboard some kind of a dashboard some applications some application right and this application probably would be viewed by loan department folks it would say that customer a customer b customer c customer a has 90% probability of defaulting customer b has 30% probability of defaulting and then you have customer c who has 50% chance of defaulting for this probably you'll say that okay let me reject the loan because there is high probability for this guy probably you'll approve the loan and for customer c probably you'll say okay let me again probably get get some collateral okay let me ask that person to pledge his property against this loan or some other process some other manual intervention is what you might you know do so ultimately you are taking decisions or you might automate this process and say that if the probability of someone defaulting is greater than 80% reject straight away if the probability of someone defaulting is less than 
you know, probably 35% approve the loan. In that way, you can define certain rules. And the moment you get the prediction outputs, those business rules would get triggered automatically. But the point that we need to understand here is batch processing or offline processing. When someone applies for a loan, is there an additional constraint on you that you need to do the uh, loan approval within a second or reject the loan in a second? Not really, right? Because people understand, customers understand that, you know, loan processing would take a while. So it is absolutely fine if you say that I would like to take the data of all these customers who are applying for the loan and daily at probably 9 p.m. Okay, daily at 9 p.m. I would like to run my machine learning algorithm across all these customers who have applied for the loan and at one go, I wish to get the batch predictions and I'm going to write these batch results into the database and then I'm going to display the results on the dashboard. Or you might say that, you know what, daily three times I'm going to process. I'll take the batch or group of all the customers who have applied for the, uh, you know, a loan and I would process that probably daily at uh, 11 a.m. once and then probably 2 p.m. and then probably at 6 p.m. You define your rules. But the point that you all have to understand here is that we are not processing every individual's loan application as in how you receive that. Instead, we are storing a batch or a group of loan applications and then we are processing it at one go. That's batch processing or offline processing. Okay. So, while this is batch processing or offline processing, we also have another thing. And that another thing is called as live streaming or online processing. So let us now take an example of live streaming data or a specific business application pertaining to handling live streaming data. Let's understand further. Okay. So now let's talk about live streaming or online processing. Okay, so. Say you have data of a credit card department. You have the data of uh, the customers who are using credit card transactions. They have 10,000 historical data. In the output variable, you have details on whether a specific credit card transaction is fraud or not fraud. In that way, say you have data available. And then say you have various inputs. You take this historical data and then say you build a machine learning algorithm. Okay. And this machine learning algorithm would take the future credit card transactions and then it would classify whether the credit card transaction is fraudulent or not. Fraud or not fraud. 
here you cannot say that you know what i'll wait for all the customer transactions for the entire day and i will process it at one go through my machine learning algorithm and then get the predictions and then i'll act upon that we cannot say that the reason we if you do that the fraudster the person who is resorting to fraud might end up using millions of dollars he would have had the mil millions of dollars right so as and how you get a credit card transaction immediately you need to predict the results you cannot afford to say that i'm going to do offline processing daily once twice thrice no here real time live streaming data as and how you get you need to process it to the okay one minute so sorry there is some scribbling happening here so i didn't do a few of the housekeeping that sorry i have now done so as and how you get the details of the new credit card transactions you need to take that you need to process it through a machine learning algorithm and then you need to predict say this customer a uh, yeah data you you have the data such as um, what was the you know credit card purchase at what time did that transaction happen which category of product was purchased so on and so forth you take that supply it through a machine learning algorithm and you get to see whether the credit card transaction is fraud or not so for this customer a say you get a probability which says there is 90% chance that this credit card transaction might be fraudulent so what do you do immediately you write this information back to your database and this information would then get displayed on the dashboard of the fraud analytics team a lot of companies have fraud analytics teams and then your banking industry especially would have a very big and a very strong fraud analytics team or fraud department they will get a pop up which says customer a has done some transaction there is 90% chance that this could be a fraudulent transaction so either they are going to decline the transaction the bank would either decline the transaction or you know the fraud team might give you a call and ask you hey customer a did you do this transaction if the answer is yes they'll approve otherwise they are going to decline the transaction then say customer b has done another transaction real time as in how the transactions are happening you take that data pass it through a machine learning algorithm and then you get the results so this time the results say that there is only 2% chance that a credit card transaction is fraudulent so once again you take this information write it back to your database and then immediately within milliseconds within milliseconds display it on the dashboard if it says there is 2% chance that the transaction performed by customer b is fraudulent then you would say that okay let me approve why worry about this there is hardly any percentage or probability that it is fraud so let me approve this transaction okay so the kind of infrastructure the kind of processing power the kind of compute that you would need varies depending on whether you have a problem which needs batch processing or whether it needs live streaming you know processing kind of a setup depending on this the infrastructure varies okay so that's the difference between batch processing offline processing versus live streaming or online processing this is how it works okay 
So we just concluded the, uh, I mean, concluded understanding the various data types. And if you ask me on whether the new data that you get, how do you supply it to your machine learning algorithm? Or does it manually happen or would it automatically happen? If you have that kind of a thought, then my answer would be twofold. One is you can also automate that by writing some scripts in the Python and you say that as in how there is a new entry that is available in the database. Trigger machine learning algorithm, get the predictions, write it back to your database. One. Second, you might say that, you know what? I'm going to manually take the data, the new data every day once. Manually, I'm going to give those inputs in Excel format or CSV format to Python and then it would do the predictions. Those I'm going to write it back to the database. Choice is yours. Which is the best way? Automatically supplying your data. Okay, even if you want to supply the data daily once, you can write a script in Python. Those are called as cron jobs. And then the moment it is say 6 p.m., the entire data would be taken and then it will do the predictions on that. Then from that time around until next day 6 p.m., the entire data would be taken next day at 6 p.m. and then you process the data if it's batch processing. If it is real-time processing, you cannot even afford a manual uh, supplying of data, right? Because credit card transactions, you'll have millions of transactions happening on a uh, not daily basis, rather every second, there'll be millions of transactions happening, right? The, the obvious way out would be automatically supplying the data to your machine learning algorithm. All right. So let me go back to the mind map to quickly show you what we have discussed. So friends, we are talking about CRISP MLQ in which we know for a fact that we have six phases. Out of that, these two, which is business understanding and data understanding constitute phase one. Then you have two, three, four, five, and six. Within data understanding, we need to collect the data, which is need, needed to solve your business problem. But before that, we wanted to understand what are the various data types and get accustomed to certain terminologies. And once you're clear with this, then we need to proceed further with data collection. And until we get into the next phase, it will be all theory going on. Okay, once we are done with uh, data collection, when well, I mean, there are two data collection or two different data sources, once we complete this discussion, then we will get into phase two. And once we get into phase two, we will be getting into Python programming and we'll be doing some bit of Python programming. All right, so until then, it will be all theory. As I've told you, we are getting introduced to the high-level concepts. And we are looking at all of these things from 30,000 feet. Once we get a high-level understanding, we will get into the details slowly and steadily. There's no rush. Okay. So let us now get into data collection. 